All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Christina, and uh, I am a technologist here with DoSpace. We are gonna get started here as soon as I remember how to use everything. There we go. Uh, and I just wanted to give you guys some tips on choosing a new cell phone, some background with me. I worked for a wireless retailer for about three and a half years selling cell phones and service plans and those sorts of things. And I learned very quickly that uh, when people were coming in and they're ready to get a new phone, maybe they're ready to get a smartphone for the first time, they didn't really know how to figure out which phone they wanted or what would fit their needs. So these are just some things that I learned over that time to kind of help you sort out what your priorities are, and how to pick something that's really going to suit you rather than just maybe going for what's flashy, what's new, and what they're selling on TV. So what I have for the most part is a series of questions to ask yourself when you are looking at getting a new smartphone. And we are talking about smartphones for the most part, though there are uh, a lot of people that stick to kind of the flip phones, the basic phones, which is fine too. Those do still work just fine. The only thing with those that uh, I noticed while I was still working in the industry is that they cost as much as a basic entry level smartphone and the, uh, the plans aren't any cheaper anymore. So uh, that was one of the things I was pushing a lot of people towards getting a smartphone, even if they didn't necessarily need all of those features. But uh, one of the first things that I like to ask people is, what do you use your phone for the most? Now, this may seem like a pretty obvious question, like, oh, I call people on my phone. But the way that you use your phone kind of can help you point towards the features and different aspects of your smartphone or your phone in general that uh, are the most important to you. And you can apply those towards moving forward to look for a new phone. So, you know, if you prim primarily do calling and texting, something that is a mid-range, um, more budget-friendly device might work for you. Um, these are still smartphones. They'll still have all of that internet capability, but they might not have as nice of a screen or as high definition of a camera, as much onboard storage, all of those things. They're gonna have a lot less of the bells and whistles, but it is still a smartphone. It still calls and texts. It still has basic internet capabilities. Uh, and th that might be what works better for you. If you watch a lot of videos, uh, or look at a lot of documents, you might be looking at a larger screen with a higher resolution, something that shows colors really well, or something that you can blow stuff up on and get a really good look at it. And if you take a lot of pictures, I mean, obviously you're gonna want a really nice camera and you're gonna wanna have some really good storage options. So not all smartphones have the capability to put a micro SD card in them. So you'll wanna either get a phone that has a lot of onboard storage or you're gonna specifically wanna look for a phone that uh, has the capability of using an SD card, those sorts of things. So sit down, ask yourself, what do you use your phone for the most? And what features of your phone do you like the most? Um, I know my favorite thing about uh, the Android platform specifically is the amount of customization that I'm able to do to my home screens. I can move all of the icons away around the way that I like. I have some in folders, but I also have a lot of like widgets, um, which are basically mini versions of an app that just kind of live on your home screen and have some limited functionality. I've got one for my Audible audiobooks, so I can start and stop those playing straight from my home screen without having to open the app. I have one home screen that is entirely dedicated to my calendar, so I don't have to find my calendar app and open it up to look at a glance and see, do I work today? Or those so sorts of things. I only have to scroll a couple pages to the right on my home screen and it's all right there for me to look at. So that's one of my favorite features. And it's one of those things that seems like a really small thing, but I know that if I had a different phone that didn't ha give me those options that I would miss it a lot. Uh, if 
you are looking at potentially getting a phone that is different than the phone that you have now. One of the things I would recommend that you do is ask your friends and family that might have that phone that you've got your eye on what their favorite features are. And you can find out if some of those things that you like or maybe dislike uh, about your current device are present on that one as well, if it's not one that you have a lot of hands-on experience with. Are there any features that you wish your phone had? So this is obviously kind of the opposite of the previous question. Is there anything that you're missing out on that uh, you've seen other people do or uh, heard about that you'd really like to have in your phone? Like maybe one of your friends has one of those really fancy Samsung phones that takes really cool slow motion videos and you've seen them post those on Facebook or you watched your friend that has an iPhone airdrop uh, a file to their iPad for a really quick transfer of data, those sorts of things. There might be something that you're not even realizing that you're missing and then you watch somebody else do it and you're like, that'd be really handy in my day-to-day -day life. So see if you can identify any of those things that your phone doesn't do, but you wish that it could. Also fairly self-explanatory, is there anything you wish your phone did better? Uh, don't really have a lot of detail for this one. You know, maybe it runs fine, but it go, it runs low on storage a lot. So you could get the next version of that phone that has more storage in it, go from 16 gigabytes to 32, or I think even the standard is like 64 to 128 gigabytes uh, at this point. Uh, if you like your phone, but the battery dies too quickly, go for something with a bigger battery capacity, those sorts of things. Uh, that one's pretty straightforward. This question, the next question is aimed more at people who maybe are looking at getting their first smartphone. Uh, it can apply to other people too, but what kind of phones do your friends and family use, the people around you? This is especially handy when you're picking out your first smartphone. Uh, not only because obviously they'll be able to help you with it while you're still, you're still learning the ropes, but you will also um, be a little bit more integrated with them. Uh, this seems like a weird thing to say, but uh, there, are, there is a certain amount of connectivity between uh, systems, operating systems, um, which we will talk about a little bit later, that you may not think about. The one that I like to use as an example a lot with iPhones is that they have two functions, iMessage and FaceTime, that are exclusive to uh, iPhones or Apple devices, I guess, because you can u utilize those on other Apple devices. And if you are looking at getting your first smartphone and you have a lot of family members that also have iPhones, it would help for you to get an iPhone because then you would be able to use, use those functions with the rest of your family. I know that a lot of grandparents like to use FaceTime to video chat with their grandkids and iMessage is um, kind of a, a faster and uh, kind of internet-based messaging that is exclusive to iPhones. I won't go into too much detail about that, but there's a ton of stuff online if you're really curious about what uh, the difference is between like iMessage and regular text messaging. And then what other devices do you use regularly? And I kind of touched on this when talking about iMessage and AirDrop and those sorts of things, but uh, in our in today's world where everybody has all these electronic devices and you know pretty much everything is internet capable these days, including our televisions, our microwaves, our dishwashers, um, realizing how your mobile phone, which for a lot of people is their main form of communication, their main line to the internet, all of those things, uh, realizing what place your mobile phone has in uh, your environment of digital devices can be really important too. So if you already use an iPad and you don't have a smartphone yet, getting an iPhone would be beneficial to you, not only because you would already be familiar with the interface, they both run very, very similarly, but because those devices would be able to link, be linked up very easily and very quickly uh, in a way that you can use them almost interchangeably. With MacBooks, the, the laptop versions, uh, the laptops that, uh, 
Apple puts out, you can connect to your phone, you can do your text messaging from your phone or on your phone from your Mac and those sorts of things. And there's a lot of similar functionality between like Samsung devices and all those, uh, you know, all the different manufacturers that make all of these sorts of things. They all have uh, lots of ways to link up their tech with each other. And it doesn't necessarily have to be within the same manufacturer. You can also link, uh, you know, if you have an Android device, those primi primarily run through Google services. So anything else that runs on Google will work really well with your Android device, those sorts of things. So you can integrate your phone into the rest of your life and vice versa by keeping in mind uh, what you can use your device with that you already have around you. So let's dig in a little bit more to different details to consider um, when it comes to smartphones. Uh, let's, there's a lot to go over here and it's a lot to consider and probably not all of these things are going to be important to you at any given time. Really, you'll probably only care about one or two, maybe three, but uh, I just kind of wanted to break some of these down um, in a way that when you're talking about them with like the sales rep or when you're perusing online, they might sound a, a little bit more relevant to you because there's one thing that they like to do, it's wow you with stats when you're uh, trying to buy a phone. And uh, while those sound really impressive, it might not be that important to you. So we'll start with size. This graphic is a little old. You'll see that it is uh, back from when the iPhone 6 was about to come out. But uh, with smartphones, you know, the, the way that we use our phones has changed. Before smartphones really started becoming uh, relevant, phones were getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now it seems like phones are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a reason for that. The way that we use our phones has fundamentally changed as they became more and more connected to the internet. We use our phones to consume more content than we used to, whether we are on social media, we're watching videos or movies, we are video chatting, like I talked about earlier, some people are reviewing documents, those sorts of things. And as we needed to be able to view things on the screen of a smartphone, the screen got bigger and it continues to do so, though it's kind of steadied out for the most part, but now they're getting skinnier and that's a whole nother thing. Uh, so when you're, when you're shopping for smartphones, when they're talking about screen size, one important thing to know is that they measure that diagonally across the screen. So where you see on here, it says 5.7 inches, 5.5 inches. That's measured on the diagonal of that screen. And uh, a lot of people, for them, it's really important that they're able to hold and operate their phone in one hand. So... Uh, the advantage of being able to go into the store, obviously, is that you're able to hold the phone, see if it fits well. I know I had plenty of customers back in my day that would see if it fit in their shirt pocket or their pants pocket because that was important to them, too. So when you're shop if you're shopping online and they're talking about size, the diagonal is what they measure that screen on. But that's not the only thing that's changed with phones. Obviously, um, they used to be thicker and they've gotten a lot thinner. Um, they had to get bigger to accommodate for all the sensors that we need in our phones now. Uh, we have RAM, we have storage, we want bigger batteries, and as our phones are able to do more, then they need cooling systems and all this other stuff. Uh, and now they, once they managed to pack all that in there, then they started getting them smaller and smaller and thinner and making the bezels smaller. So your phone is more screen than not these days. So keep in mind how you are going to carry your phone around. There are a lot of things. I'm sure that you've seen them uh, on the back of like every teenager's phone, but there's uh, pop sockets, which are little things that pop out. You could put your fingers around them that help you hold your phone more steadily. And that helps with the one-handed uh, use, but it isn't always the perfect solution. So just keep size in mind and what's going to be convenient for you. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, just a fun little fact, when I was selling phones, I noticed that it tended to be women that bought the bigger phones more often than men. And I think that was because uh, we usually have like purses or other things that we can carry our phone around in, whereas most men are carrying them around in their pocket. Though the men do have bigger pockets, so for some reason that doesn't seem fair. 
Anyway, moving on to the next one, and this is a really big one, you guys, operating system. So when it comes to smartphones, the two main camps are uh, iOS from Apple and Android. There used to be Windows phones, and there are some other like really small ones that you have to really go search for. There's like BlackBerry, um, though I think BlackBerry phones might be running Android now. Anyway, I digress. Uh, there are really just these two options nowadays for most, most consumers. And the difference between these is really hard to kind of state outright because at the end of the day, they do both do the same thing. They both run your phone and you know that you make phone calls, you download apps, all of, they help manage your battery, all of those sorts of things. At the end of the day, they really do the same thing. Uh, iOS is only available on iPhones. So if you're going to be running an iOS device, you're getting an iPhone, but there is a wide range of iPhones that are available to you. But that's not the same thing. That's not the same deal with Android. Android is an operating system, but it is used on multiple companies' phones. So you've got like Samsung, LG, Motorola, all of those people use the Android operating system, but it doesn't always look the same on their devices either. If you're looking for like the pure Android, Android is made by Google. So Google Pixel phones are running the quote, pure version of Android. All the other manufacturers, what they do is they have Android and then they build kind of their own mask that goes over it. So it looks different and it runs a little bit different specific to their phones. And then that's what goes out on their phones. And one of the things that you'll hear a lot in the Apple versus Android argument is about software updates. And I did, uh, a basic mobile device health webinar a few weeks ago that talked about how software updates are really important to stay uh, caught up on. And with Apple iOS, since they make their phones and they make their operating system and there's just the one version out there, when a software update goes out for an iPhone, it goes out for all iPhones and they stay up to date a lot more easily. The same is not true with Android because the manufacturers all have kind of their own unique version of Android. So if you have a Google Pixel, then you're getting the pure Android update straight from Google. The rest of the companies have to wait until Google sends, up, sends them the update and then they can tool with it, do whatever they need specific to their platform and then send that out to their customers. So software updates are a little bit slower on Android devices if that's the kind of thing that's important to you. Uh, and with iOS, they're much faster. In general, iOS is considered to be more straightforward. It's a pretty clean, simple to use system. It's got less options to play around with and it can be more consistent which is something that a lot of people like. Whereas Android, like I talked about earlier, has a lot of possibility for customization, a lot of things that you can kind of fiddle with and get just so. And it really depends on, you know, usability versus customability. So whatever's more important to you is going to be one of those things. But this is also, you know, we talked about all of your friends and family, what they have. And sometimes really all you have to do is all you can do is get your hands in and dig into these operating systems. And if it's one that you're not familiar with and you try it and you don't like it, then there's nothing, there's no harm in sticking with what you know. Now I want to talk a little bit about price. Uh, I did touch earlier about mid-range devices, budget-friendly devices that can be a little bit cheaper. Um, and I think that those really are kind of the unknown gem when it comes to smartphones because obviously these big flagship devices like the iPhones that you see on your screen right now, those are the ones that the companies want you to buy because those are the ones that are going to make them a lot of money and those are the ones that they spend their marketing budget on. But if you're not planning on using your smartphone for all of those big uh, fancy functions, that's not necessarily uh, something that you need to do. There are a lot of really great options on the lower end 
uh, for smartphones. Unfortunately, most of those are going to be Android devices. Uh, Apple doesn't really play around with the budget devices much, but I did hear that they are coming out with a new version of the iPhone SE, which is generally more affordable and smaller if you're looking for a smaller screen size. Uh, but the cool thing about those budget smartphones is I've seen them for as low as like $199.99 at full retail price. And the, the thing about pricing with smartphones is it can be hard to break down because of the way that it works when you're going to Sprint or Verizon or AT&T or T-Mobile because they want you to do all of their installment billing or leasing or whatever they call it. They're, they're in their installment plans where you're going to pay monthly for the phone bundled in with your service plan. And I'm not saying that these are bad because as long as you're able to pay a little bit more month to month, you are able to get these higher end flagship devices a lot more easily than if you were having to pay some, if not all of the full retail device, uh, retail price of those up front because they're getting up to the eight, nine hundred dollar ranges and Several of them are over $1,000 at full retail price at this point. But the fact is that you can get a smartphone for $200, $300, uh, if that's really all that you're looking for. You're gonna wanna look at the specs because obviously you wanna make sure that there aren't any features that you're missing out on that are important to you. Like we talked about, storage is, an, uh, is usually a big one. Uh, camera quality is a big one, screen quality is a big one. Those aren't gonna be as high in those budget-friendly devices, but if you want a smartphone and you don't wanna spend 30, 40, $50 a month on it, or even wanna just buy it and not have it on your monthly bill, there are two to $300 options in smartphones that are available to you. So when the salesperson is showing you all the shiny new iPhones that just hit the shelf, you know, make sure to ask for those options. See if uh, you can take a look at them and if that's what's gonna work for you, then that's what works. Durability is a really big thing with smartphones. Uh, I'm gonna go over this big gra uh, in, uh, graphic that I've got here uh, in just a second. But uh, in this day and age, phones are mostly screen. And they have glass backs, uh, which allow for wireless charging, which is a really cool technology that we're still playing with, but it also means that our phones can't be metal on the back anymore. Uh, they mostly have aluminum frames, and, uh, but the they're mostly glass <laughs> at this point. And the glass that they use gets stronger every year, but it is still glass. There's really no way to sugarcoat that. So phones are just not as durable as they used, used to be. Even when they were mostly plastic, they were a little bit more durable than they are now. Uh, and if you work in a job or in, or in an environment where your phone is likely to get dropped onto hard services a lot, it, this is something that you want to keep in mind. Now there are rugged smartphones. Uh, that is a thing. Uh, they're, they can be hard to find since they're so specialized, but you can get smartphones that are built with a rugged, rubberized casing. And it's not, and it's not just like a decorative case. It's an actual, it's part of the phone. Uh, but if you need one of those, you're going to want to go out of your way to find one. Uh, and then the other thing that they tout as far as durability with phones a lot these days is their water resistance. And I say water resistance, not waterproof, because those are very different things and no phone is waterproof. In fact, hardly anything is waterproof. Mostly you're going to find them water resistant. And you've probably seen when they're talking about water resistance, this, these numbers, IP68, IP67, you've probably seen those going around. And so this graphic that I have up on the screen here actually explains how to read those. On the left column, that is your protection against solids, and the right column is the protection against liquids. So IP, which uh, stands for ingress protection, is going to start that, and then the first number is your protection against solid objects. And you can see here a zero is no protection. A one is protected against solid objects over 50 millimeters. And it gives some examples, so on and so forth. Up to six, which is total protection against dust. 
And then the second number is the protection against liquids. So once again, zero will be no protection. One, protected against vertically falling drops of water, so rain. Protected against direct sprays up to 15 degrees from vertical, that's number two. And so on and so forth, all the way down to protected against long periods of immersion, depth more than one meter specified by manufacturer. Uh, and that's eight. So if you see IP68, that means that that device, uh, and this applies to more things than just phones, this is uh, an electronics, uh, I lost the word that I was looking for, I'm so sorry. Uh, this, this is a standard amongst like electronics and uh, other things that if, you, if it says IP68, it is totally protected against dust and it is protected against long periods of immersion. So it can go underwater for a decent amount of time. This does not mean that it's waterproof though. Some other things to talk about. These ones we're gonna go over a little bit less in depth. Um, we have accessories. Uh, one of the things that they do after they make, after you've decided on a phone is they immediately ask you what kind of case that you want. Uh, as much as people like to uh, skip cases or I'm going to go look for one online and they'll spend $10 and get a really nice looking one on Amazon. One thing that I do want to point out, especially if you went ahead and you got that Samsung or that iPhone, um, I know that an Otterbox or uh, an Incipio, these other brands that really are built for drop protection can be a little bit pricey. You're talking 40, 50, 60 dollars up to like 100 for a life proof case. I know that those can seem like a lot of money to spend, but you're talking about protecting an eight to 1200 dollars investment at that point. And I have seen enough people with dropped phones. Uh, right out the parking lot even as they were leaving the store and they're like, I'm going to shop online. I'll get a case later. It's really something that you want to make sure that you are protecting your investment because especially if you're going to be doing the installment billing, that is, that is an investment that you are making. So take your time, research your accessories, and don't be afraid to spend a little bit more on a case, especially if you are worried about durability. The more popular devices will have more cases available to them. This is an inevitable truth. So it'll start with iPhones. Those will have more options. Next will be the Samsung Galaxies and kind of down from there. So if you do go for a budget range uh, device, you might not have as many case options available to you. It might take a little bit more research, uh, but it is worth it in the end, especially uh, I recommend even though we're kind of on a one year refresh cycle, trying to keep your phone for two to three years at the very least. Uh, so take, take your time, get a nice case, get a screen protector, uh, because when a phone is mostly screen, that's what's gonna break first. Uh, there is also other things to consider when it comes to accessories. Uh, there are whole ecosystems that are being built around things to kind of add to or supplement your phone. Headphones are a big one, uh, starting with Apple with their AirPods. You know, wireless connectivity is a very big thing now, so you can look for a nice pair of Bluetooth headphones, especially since most phones don't come with a headphone jack anymore. Uh, wireless chargers, I mentioned those earlier, those are uh, very big. You want to make sure that you look for the ones that are compatible with your device. Um, so ask those questions, do that research. But there are uh, a lot of really fun accessories that you can get that can really make your phone a lot more useful to you and make it last longer and make, make sure that you take care of it. Uh, battery, that one's pretty obvious. Uh, I thought about talking here about the difference between embedded and removable batteries, but I feel like that topic is a couple years gone by this point. Uh, I did work in the industry kind of during that transition when the flagship phones, the most expensive high-end phones, for the most part, did still have removable batteries. Uh, and then they started taking that away, and that was a very hot topic for a while. And the reality is that well, it does make the phones uh, less easily repairable or uh, it obviously you can't just buy a new battery for 20 or 30 bucks online and get battery life in your phone like it's brand new again. Uh, 
the having that embedded battery is actually better for your device health in the long run. You know, taking it in and out does wear out the pins that connect the battery to the phone. You have the potential to get dust and liquid in there with it being able to be opened. And then that also gives those things more access to other internal functions of your phone. So really it's about uh, longevity uh, of your device by keeping that battery embedded. Camera, we talked about that too. If you know, it's if you take a lot of pictures on your phone and having a nice camera is important to you, then that's one of the things that you're gonna look for. These days they have it, they can only do so much to make the cameras themselves better. So they're putting more uh, and different kinds of lenses and sensors uh, onto the cameras. You'll see that you get phones with two or three different cameras on them at this point, uh, which is really cool, especially if uh, you are looking for a lot of options when it comes to your amateur photography or even professional photography. There are a lot of people that are uh, doing videography on their phones uh, and it can be a nice way to get into that sort of thing if you are looking at it, but you don't wanna spend extra money on also getting a really nice camera. You can invest in a really nice phone since most people are already gonna have a phone and play around with those sorts of things. And then storage. Storage is the last thing that I wanna talk about. Uh, phones come with quite a bit of onboard storage these days. Like I said, I think the standard is about 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes, but you can probably get phones that are close to a terabyte of storage built in these days. Uh, and then there are also phones that do still have the capability to add a micro SD card for further storage up to two terabytes. Though it is very difficult to find a two terabyte micro SD card and it would be very expensive. Uh, I like micro SD cards. I think they're really handy for when you are switching devices. You can take all of that data out of one phone and put it into the other without having to wait for it to transfer over a cable or wirelessly, which is something that uh, we are able to do now. Uh, but you just want to keep in mind that for most people, what takes up the most storage in their phone these days is not necessarily pictures and videos. Those the, Though those do typically take up the second most amount of room, but the biggest culprit is actually apps. So apps, as they've gotten fancier, there's been more of them and they can do more, they have more capability. They also have gotten bigger in how much space they take up on your phone. So if you're a person that has a lot of apps, maybe you like to play mobile games, those, or you use them for functionality for work or you know whatever suits you, if you're going to be having a lot of apps, then storage is something to keep in mind too, because you're going to need all of those extra gigabytes to download all of those apps, or you're going to be constantly uninstalling and reinstalling things in order to add them to your phone. So that's it. That was a big list. Uh, I know that uh, it can be really overwhelming to look at all the different options and to even know what you want. Uh, to figure that out. So I hope that this kind of gave you an idea of some things to keep in mind to help narrow down those options to what's really gonna work best for you. Uh, and I'm, I'm definitely available to ask questions if you guys have any. While we wait to ask, uh, to see if there's any questions, uh, there is one other thing that I can talk about, uh, which is the transferring of your information between devices when you get a new one. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the manufacturers have created an app for that. Usually you can do it either wirelessly or through a cable, uh, but it is easier to, by design, to stay within the same platform if you're transferring your information over because not everything is going to be formatted correctly to go from iPhone to Android or vice versa. So if you have a lot of information that you're really afraid to lose, it can be beneficial to stay in the same platform as well, which seems like a pretty obvious thing, but sometimes it's not something that is at the forefront of your mind when you're shopping for a new phone. All right, doesn't look like we have any questions. And if you think of something afterwards, you can definitely feel free to shoot us an email, hit us up on Facebook, or we do have a live chat available on our website at dospace.org. If you wanna email a question, that's gonna be hello at dospace.org. 
And I want to thank you guys so much for coming and everybody have a wonderful evening.